So I'll just request my uh, panel to just mute themselves uh, when we start. Hi everyone, it's um, 12 noon, so we're gonna start on time. Thanks uh, to all the participants and my faculty for dialing in to the APSC JCS 2020 webinar. Today's uh, this lunch hour topic is on biomarkers, the APSC consensus and future use case in diabetes, mellitus, and COVID-19. Uh, the session is organized by APSC and JCS, is endorsed by the Singapore Cardiac Society, as well as the ISCP. This session is sponsored by Roche Diagnostic. I would like to put a date stamp to this. This is the 31st July, 2020, 12 noon Singapore time. So these are my esteemed speakers, as well as panelists, which I'll introduce uh, one by one. My name is Jack. I'm a cardiologist from Singapore, the current president of the Asian Pacific Society of Cardiology. We meet our good friends here, um, Associate Professor Inoue Kenji, uh, Associate Prof at the Department of Cardiology, Gentendo University in Japan. Dr. Cynthia Papendik is an emergency physician at the Royal Adelaide Hospital, Australia. We have Dr. Chanchao Chandramole, a clinical research fellow at the National Heart Center, Singapore, specializing in heart failure and basic science research. We are very happy to welcome Associate Professor David Lai, our Director at the Infectious Disease Research and Training Office at our National Center for Infectious Disease in Singapore. So he's very experienced and he's going to educate us on COVID-19 related matters. With me, our panelists, First off, I'd like to welcome Professor Genesis. We call him affectionately Prof G. He's a senior physician at, uh, for cardiology at uh, University Hospital Hyderabad in Germany. Um, good friends here also, Professor Sazali, a cardiologist and professor of medicine and the university director. Oh, I didn't see that your university director now, congrats. At the UITM Medical Specialist Center, Malaysia. We have also Dr. Leila, who is the Chief Clinical Pathologist at the Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, as well as the Chief Scientific Officer at the National Reference Laboratory of the country at the UAE. A disclaimer, the content on this webinar is copyrighted by APSC and should not be distributed without the permission of APSC. Just ask me, I'll say okay, but just ask me please. 
The views and opinions expressed in the webinar are those of the faculty members and do not represent those officially of APSC. A bit of housekeeping. Um, you are on a live streaming now via Rutherford Medicine, APSC Facebook and YouTube pages. For Singapore registered physicians, CME point will be awarded to attendees who are active for at least one hour. This CME, uh, this session is also EBEC uh, accredited for one CME point for attendees who attend the full session. You will get your cert a certificate of attendance after you complete an online survey sent by email for the webinar. This is for the EBEC accreditation. For the Q&A, please uh, feel free to type in Q&A anytime. Uh, the purpose of this webinar session is to make it interactive. So the talks, we try to keep it short. We try to give equal amounts of time for a Q&A session. So leave your questions here. We'll endeavor to answer all questions raised. Um, and I'm surprised that some of my Muslim colleagues agreed to attend this session as faculty, as participants. I'd like to wish everyone Salamat Hari Raya Haji. And uh, it's a public holiday, so I think uh, education goes on and uh, I'm very happy that uh, everyone has a blessed weekend ahead. So the next uh, session coming on at four o'clock is our APSC consensus statement on mitral clip. And that happens at four o'clock. But I want to make a pitch for tomorrow's session where we'll do our APSC virtual convocation uh, ceremony. So that will be a fun event. And I hope people dial in for that as well on a Saturday. So with that, I'm going to stop share. And our first speaker of the day is Professor Inoue Kenji, who helped lead the APSC consensus statement together with the panelists you've seen here. So we're going to have him speak to the APSC consensus for assessment of ACS using high sensitive troponin T at the ED followed by the talk given by Cynthia, which she will talk about the zero and one hour algorithm in Australia, a real world uh, study addressing a rapid troponin T. Then we'll take a pause to take all the Q&A after the first session. We will focus on high sensitive troponin T in Asia. So with that, we'll, let, uh, we'll have uh, Professor Kenji Inoue start his lecture. Prof. My name is Kenji Inoue from Juntendo University Nerima Hospital, Tokyo, Japan. The title I'd like to present today is APSC Consensus for Assessment of Acute Coronary Syndrome Using High Sensitivity Troponin T in Emergency Department. Let me start with background. Chest pain is a common reason for emergency room visit to rule out an acute coronary syndrome. However, only the minority is diagnosed as acute coronary syndrome, and therefore a large number of patients is admitted to the hospital inappropriately. This practice produces an increase in cost and overcrowds the emergency rooms with a negative impact on the patient and the healthcare system. Waiting times are a pressing societal problem and efficient treatment pathways which are essential to ensure the accurate, timely, and cost-effective early management of patients with acute coronary syndrome. Conversely, misdiagnosis and treatment inefficiency are associated with increased morbidity, mortality, and cost. Therefore, we have to consider lots of things simultaneously. Save life save money, save time, and save facilities. Save my life, the mortality rate of acute myocardial infarction is still high, it's around 30%, and save money, examination, including coronary angiography, is expensive. As you may know, the time is money, Facilities are very limited. Hospitals have very limited facilities. You may recall the European Society of Cardiology guideline for the first time in 2011. 
the availability of the high sensitivity troponin assay has substantially changed the management of patients presenting with chest pain, both from a diagnostic and therapeutic perspective. At the time, diagnostics the algorithm with the assessment at baseline and three hours were proposed. This algorithm is still variable. But half a year ago, European Society of Cardiology Guidelines has published a new algorithm named Zero One Algorithm. It can shorten the observation time from three hours to one hour and show the exact number which make a non-cardiologist, even non-cardiologist, to make a decision easily. And patients were stratified into three groups by measuring the concentration of cardiac troponin T using a high sensitivity assay at the time of the presentation and after one hour. It could therefore speed up diagnosis and treatment and rule out acute myocardial infarction more efficiently and save cost. If the patient showed low level of high sensitivity troponin T and no significant change in one hour, then the patient can be back home. On the other hand of a spectrum, if the patient comes with very high high sensitivity troponin T value and compatible clinical finding with acute coronary syndrome, you can rule in the patient or if after one hour, here is significant increase the level of high sensitivity troponin T level. Again, you can consider acute myocardial infarction. In between these groups, it calls as observation group. You can need to further examination. You are requiring another diagnostic testing. The algorithm is not published in American Heart Association or Asian guidelines. Therefore, it was three years ago, thanks to Dr. Paul Lee and Xu Chen from Taiwan. Uh, we collected uh, around 400 patients with suspected of non ST elevation myocardial infarction. And fortunately, none of the patients with acute myocardial infarction in rule out group. In general, when the number of low risk patients is large, the denominator is inflated. However, our cohort was rated as a moderate risk group according to the established three different risk scores, as you can see and contained more than 14% of acute myocardial infarction. Therefore, we believe this cohort reflects the real-world data. And I hope this algorithm is also fit for patients in Asian Pacific regions. The Asian Pacific region comprises around 50 countries including seven from 10 of the most densely populated countries worldwide. Cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in the world and half of the cases of cardiovascular disease are estimated to occur in Asia. Most Asian countries except for Japan, South Korea, Singapore, and Thailand have higher age-adjusted mortality from cardiovascular disease, prolonged emergency department staying or overcrowding in emergency department also a problem, and it can delay in receiving appropriate care. Scientific collaboration between Asian Pacific Society of Cardiology and Roche aimed to develop and publish the APSC expert consensus of the use of high sensitivity troponin T in Asian Pacific. Yeah, so actually we had a twice opportunities to discuss about this algorithm with the Asian cardiologists from Singapore, UAE, Japan, China, Taiwan, 
uh, Malaysia, uh, Vietnam, Australia, and Thailand. Yeah, it's that's a great opportunity actually. And we also invited uh, uh, Dr. Evan Diros Genesis from uh, Germany as a, a supervisor. And finally, thanks to uh, Dr. Wei Chi Jack Tan, we can publish the consensus in circulation journal in this year. To establish the algorithm, we modified three points. First is a single measurement troponin T assessment. A single measurement of high sensitivity troponin T less than 5 nanogram was 90 90.8% while the negative predictive value for death was 100% according to previous report. Preliminary data from an ongoing our study also showed that this cutoff ruled out acute coronary syndrome in 80-80 patient and further follow-up showed now the patients were eventually diagnosed with acute myocardial infarction in 30 days follow-up observations. But if you can include the 5 nanogram per liter of high sensitivity troponin T in first test, the number of the patients are 228 patients. There were 4 patients whose second troponin level showed more than 14 nanogram per liter. According to the false definition of acute myocardial infarction proposed by ESG or AHA, two patients were diagnosed as a type 2 myocardial infarction due to vasospastic angina, and one lady was as a myocardial injury because no event in 30 days of the patient. However, a 67 years old lady was diagnosed as type 1 acute myocardial infarction because her coronary angiography showed serious coronary artery disease and she underwent cabbage immediately after the examination. We have a room to observe one hour to more up to three hours. Every effort should be made to aim for one hour, but this consensus acknowledged that this may not be possible in many centers in the region. And the third modified point is just a cutoff value in the ruling group. As the various publications have defined very high cardiac troponin concentration as a more than five for the upper limit of normal, and with the currently available high sensitivity troponin T assay system having an upper limit of normal value of 14 nanogram per liter, then the rule in cutoff adopted was 70 nanogram per liter, which considered to improve the positive predictive value for acute myocardial infarction. A majority of the expert committee recommended higher cutoffs. This cutoff is considered appropriate in most centers in Asia where limited catheterization capacities or reimbursement issues prevent early catheterization in the majority of patients. I apply the APSC algorithm into my cohort data, which including the more than 1700 patients and left figure indicates the ESG algorithm. On the other hand, right figure indicates the APSG algorithm. And please keep in mind, I observed only one hour, not three hours observations. Fortunately, none of the patients were diagnosed with acute myocardial infarction in rural groups. And in rural group, the prevalence of acute myocardial infarction is slightly increased in 38.80% in according to APSC algorithm. So, so far, uh, 03 algorithm or 01 algorithm or 
APSC algorithm should be fine. Honestly speaking, the longer observation might be the better. One hour, three hour, or eight hours should be fine if you have a room to observe the patient. Most important thing is a serial measurement of the troponin according to Bayesian theorem. First test of troponin is a kind of the pre which you can estimate is the pretest probability, and second test just can decrease the probability as post test probability. Now, its conclusion. Please keep in mind. We are not ruling out the coronary artery disease, but just rule out non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. As you can see, there are some patients with unstable angina pectoris or vasospastic angina in the rule out group. So you also definitely need to assess the clinical symptom of the patient, or sometimes uh, you need to check the patient condition using the uh, another modality like a coronary CT or a stress talium scintigraphy. And we need a further examination for Asian patients using AP APSC algorithm. For example, we need to analyze the, uh, how can reduce the medical cost or something like that. Okay, thank you very much for attention. So thanks, Kenji, an excellent lecture. I think thanks for also chipping in and fleshing out and getting the paper published. It was a great uh, endeavor. Um, we are going to move into the next lecture, but I, I just want to pick up some thoughts and address some of the Q&A before we move on uh, for some people to think about. Uh, just a quick thing about uh, high sensitive troponinity and cardiologists. Um, the data coming out of the US suggests that most of the lawsuits come out due to misdiagnosis. And when you talk, come out with a misdiagnosis, it's usually mis AMI diagnosis, not in the therapeutics, not in the PCI, not in the bypass. So I think there's always that fear. And that's why I think it's great. We're going to hear from Cynthia the perspective about discharging patients with chest pain. So I think it's always a tug of war between cardiologists, ED physician, about who is safe to discharge versus not. We also heard a bit about this high sensitivity troponin T. We're going to probably ask around the panel, uh, Dr. Leila, Prof. G, their opinion, because the questions you can hear, is there any difference between high sensitive troponin T or I? Uh, what is, uh, is there a role for a baseline level in patients with renal impairment? For example, can you reference a previous visit uh, with someone with end-stage renal failure, the troponin, that's a baseline, and you can use that as a reference point, or you still go by the algorithm? for renal failure patients. So these are some very pertinent questions. And of course, we're going to discuss a little bit around whether if you already have a high sensitive troponin test, do you need to do heart score, timine risk score, EDEX scoring in the ED? I think these are some of the more practical points that we'll discuss uh, right after uh, uh, Dr. Cynthia's uh, talk. So we're, we're going to just do the talk first, then we'll come back and address those questions as one poll. So we're going to um, ask uh, Dr. Cynthia now uh, to uh, play his uh, recording for the talk. And, um Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Cynthia Papanik, and I'm an emergency physician from South Australia. Thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity to present to you the results of the rapid TNT trial. Rapid TNT was a randomized control trial examining two algorithms for the assessment of emergency patients presenting with symptoms suspicious for ACS. The first was a rapid protocol, one hour long, using a high sensitivity troponin T versus a three hour conventional pathway using conventional troponin reporting. As a background, the emergency department workup for ACS is, is fraught with problems. Basically, symptoms suggestive of ACS are a common presenting complaint to the emergency department. And it is a very high risk diagnosis and one that the public is very, very aware of. So they know to report early. 
but we use a risk strategy system, which is based often on objective and poorly specific criteria. And often there is occasional atypical presentations with poor outcomes. And as a result, overtesting tends to be the norm. And overtesting is not good for patients and it's not good for the hospital system. Overtesting results in patients waiting in emergency departments for prolonged periods of time for repeated troponins or repeated assessment. And patients who are thought to be at higher risk are then offered admission for continued workup for investigation. And this is extraordinarily inefficient as most of the patients that are admitted will not turn out to have acute coronary syndrome. And as such, you will spend in Australia about $175,000 on every ACS diagnosis that you make because it requires 25 patients to be admitted to find that one case. High sensitivity troponin offers us some hope in that it has, with its increased sensitivity, it has an increased negative predictive value. And that may allow us to discharge more patients safely, more rapidly, and with more confidence. In 2011, South Australian hospitals had their troponin assay replaced. We had been using the fourth generation Roche troponin T assay, the conventional assay, and it was replaced with the high sensitivity fifth generation in 2011 in all public hospitals across South Australia. There were many concerns raised at the time as to how we were going to interpret these new numbers. And there was quite a lot of fear that we were going to overwhelm the system with non-value added testing of patients with these new values that we couldn't interpret. So the state made a decision to mask the values and prevent us from seeing the high sensitivity values until we had further information as to how to safely interpret them. So I'll just talk you through how that was done. Basically the fourth generation assay reported down to 29 nanograms per liter and that's what a clinician would get when they did the, uh, a test, a troponin test. The new assay would have reported down to five nanograms per liter at the level of detection, but this was masked to clinicians in South Australia, and they were only provided figures to a level of 29 nanograms per liter. So all clinicians in South Australia were blinded to the new results due to fears about how to interpret these new high sensitivity values. We did an initial trial unveiling some of the values to patients and found no real difference at one year in patient outcomes and it didn't change management. We continued to try and find evidence elsewhere and could find no patient level randomized trial comparing a standard protocol versus a rapid high sensitivity approach. We realized at that point that we were in a unique position to do a comparison because of the decision that had been made by the state to blind us to the results. What we sought to answer was the, what the clinical impact would be on patient outcomes and ED efficiency of a higher performing assay incorporated into a more rapid protocol. Our primary hypothesis was that compared to our standard practice, clinical care based on a one-hour high sensitivity protocol would provide non-inferior clinical outcomes of 30 days. The secondary uh, uh, hypothesis was that patients discharged from the ED using this protocol would have a 30-day death or new MI or recurrent MI of less than 1%. In terms of the study designed, our, we designed a prospective patient level randomized non-inferior evaluation of a one hour protocol using the high sensitivity reporting, comparing it to a three hour protocol using a masked reporting result, less than 29, in patients with suspected ACS. This was done at four metropolitan public hospitals, public emergency departments in Adelaide from 2015 through 19, we did receive funding. However, none of the funding influenced the study design 
or the result reporting. The outcome measures we were primarily interested in was the 30-day composite endpoint of all cause mortality and any infarction as uh, defined by the fourth universal definition of myocardial infarction. We had numerous secondary clinical outcomes, including the occurrence of all-cause mortality or new ACS at 12 months, and other hospital resource issues such as unplanned admissions, uh, new diagnosis of CVA, arrhythmias, CCF, et cetera. We included patients for, uh, as considered eligible for enrollment who presented with clinical features suspicious of ACS, with baseline ECG that did not show definitive ischemia, who were greater than 18 and willing to give consent. We excluded patients who were being admitted for non-chest uh, pain related reasons, who were presenting as a result from a transfer from another hospital for the workup of ACS, or were re-presenting with a workup for ACS within the past 30 days or on dialysis. Uh, in terms of how the trial was implemented, we had study coordinators on the floor of the emergency department. They monitored the screen. If a patient was found that met criteria, an ECG was performed and, the, uh, and was assessed as to be whether it was ischemic. If it was not, the patient was approached for consent. They were then, if they consented, were randomized to either the high sensitivity one hour protocol or a standard protocol. In terms of our standard protocol, uh, this was what I believe most emergency departments uh, are doing these days, which is a uh, serial troponins and a clinical assessment, which includes ECG and risk stratification. And based upon the results, um, they are either discharged or admitted to hospital for further workup. The protocol that we used for our one hour assessment was based on the European Society of Cardiology one hour protocol for high sensitivity troponin. And basically it divided patients into uh, based upon troponin results, either a rule in, a rule out, or an observe category. Basically patients who ruled in were recommended for admission. Patients who ruled out were recommended for discharge and patients who were in the observe category were admitted for further troponin testing. In terms of results, we randomized 3,378 patients, equal numbers in both arms, baseline characteristics similar in both groups. The results of the triage recommendations, 33% were recommended for admission in the standard care group as opposed to 26% in the high sensitivity group. So this was a combination of definitive admission for a rule in MI and the observe group. 72% were discharged, uh, were recommended for discharge and ruled out for MI with the high sensitivity protocol as opposed to 65% being recommended for discharge in the standard protocol. Very similar diagnoses in each group, slightly more diagnosis of myocardial infarction, but not statistically significant in the standard care group. In terms of the primary endpoint, 30-day death or MI, there was no statistical difference between the two groups, so we met the criteria of non-inferiority. It was interesting though, that in terms of representation or revisiting the hospital for a non-elective coronary angio or heart failure, et cetera, that was slightly larger in the one hour group. Um, so 1.4% return versus 0.92 in the standard care. In terms of further testing, there was a slight increase in a functional test uh, selection in the standard care group and a slightly greater precedent of a coronary angiogram in the uh, intervention group at 10.4%. 
In terms of the length of stay in ED, in the intervention group, it was 4.5 hours, and in the standard group, 5.6. In terms of discharge from the emergency department, 45% of the one hour group of the intervention group were discharged directly from ED, as opposed to 33% of the standard care group. So in summary, the one hour protocol is as safe for discharge as our standard three hour protocol. And once systems are optimized, the protocol may improve efficiency as it is faster and discharges more patients directly from the emergency department. Our 12 month follow up results will be instructive in terms of outcomes and cost effectiveness. The challenge will be to incorporate this into clinical practice in the ED to achieve the benefits of a more efficient and rapid turnaround while avoiding the risk of overtesting. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Cynthia. That, that's a great perspective and uh, congratulations for a study from you and Derek. Uh, Derek couldn't join us, so we're gonna pick on you for the study later. But now we're gonna just spend quite a lot of time just addressing all the questions from the participants first. I'd like to start off with a question uh, maybe directed at Prof G uh, first. Is uh, from Doreen at Kutepua Hospital. She's a chief pharmacist uh, for cardiology there. And she's asking if a guy comes in, for example, with pneumonia, breathlessness, you know, there's some infection going on. Uh, is it still useful to diagnose a type 2 MI and just everyone should get a troponin? Are we having a condition called troponitis? Uh, too much troponin is being done, like what Cynthia is talking about. Uh, Prof G, what, what's your take? Is it still important to diagnose a type 2 MI? and do troponin teas on everyone. Yeah, so this question is uh, indeed a little bit difficult because it depends on the strategy and the philosophy behind troponin testing. And uh, so what, what is difficult about it is that a patient who presents with an uh, infection may uh, also have an underlying uh, comorbidity that includes coronary artery disease and he may well present with a complication of type 1 or type 2 MI. So uh, only because he has an infection, you cannot say that uh, an, an acute myocardial injury in a symptomatic patient with shortness of breath is automatically a type 2 MI. It may well be a type 1 MI, and that depends on, let's say, the scrutiny and the experience of the physician. I am against the category of type 2 MI without having knowledge of coronary anatomy or the presence of plaque rupture and so forth. So in my hospital, we are doing routinely troponin testing in symptomatic patients <coughs> presenting with uh, a broad spectrum of cardiovascular symptoms, including shortness of breath. And I'm sure that uh, infections are sometimes complicated. I mean, other, the other way around. Acute heart failure may, may also be complicated by an acute infection, may be a trigger for that. And, and uh, uh, acute myocardial infarction may be masked by a, a coexistent infection. So it's a, a very, very difficult. And a panel of biomarkers uh, may well improve diagnosis and guide therapy and, uh, uh, of course, uh, gives you prognostic information. So I'm a fan of doing uh, a panel of biomarkers in ED patients, but not to everybody, to be clear. So thanks, uh, Prof G. Um, I think there's a difficult question. Uh, Doreen always asks difficult questions of us, uh, but it's pertinent. I think I, I mentioned the fact that there are a lot of lawsuits on misdiagnosis. And just to clarify the scene there, patients with pneumonia with a type 2 MI has worse outcome than those who don't have a troponin rise. We know that for a fact, because they do have underlying, probably multivessel disease, participating a type 2 MI. So, and often those are the cases that we miss and we get uh, penalized for. So I think it's not an easy question. I think we, there's still clinical judgment going on, but it's easier to do than not, I think, than giving rise to troponitis. I would like to address the second question from um, the audience, which is, we, we're talking about troponin T here, right? So I just want to just have one uh, answer from Dr. Leila. Is there any disadvantage or Maybe a quick one on the pros and cons of troponin T versus I, if both are equivalently high sensitive. 
Well, thank you, Jack. So really the studies comparing the two head to head uh, didn't really show any um, significant difference between the two, uh, to be honest. Um, the reason I like the uh, TROP T more is, is that the assay is, is standardized. It is the only TROP T assay. So the cutoffs that we're talking about anywhere in the world are the same pretty much cutoffs. Uh, although I, I came to understand that the US probably are using a slightly different kit than, than the rest of the world, but, but it's pretty much the same uh, patent really. What with the TROP I, you have it on various platforms and you have to be mindful of that when you're uh, applying your algorithms. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, really, uh, if you apply the same uh, criteria and uh, you're looking at serial uh, changes in the troponin and so on, they perform pretty much the same. And so it's a matter of getting used to your own uh, lab reference and specimen with it's TOI. But can I just ask a bit of a pointer on the actual troponin of T versus I? Is there any other thing that affects the reading? For example, hemolysis affects more in T versus I in the ED drawn specimen. Is there any peculiarities or rate of detection rate of rise uh, in your experience between T and I? So, you know, the, the thing with the TROP I is you have a lot of it compared to T. So, you know, there is a lot of I that we can measure compared to TROP T. Um, so then you can maybe the magnitude of the increase and so on is maybe more dramatic. Uh, but then using uh, the the nanogram units have uh, simplified that for, for TROP I, for the high sensitivity TROP I. Um, TROP I, uh, TROP T. So the TROP I assays used to suffer from uh, interferences from fibrinogens and so on. So that's a problem sometimes uh, uh, if, uh, if the specimen wasn't uh, uh, anticoagulated adequately or if it was spun very quickly. So we can, uh, we can sometimes get those artifacts in the lab. I would have to say though that recently the assays that are uh, being launched uh, have overcome this problem. Hemolysis interferes uh, negatively actually with TROP T assay and, and one have to be mindful of that. Uh, so this is why uh, laboratories have to note if the sample is hemolyzed or not. Uh, because, you know, again, especially if you're looking at a particular cutoff or if you're looking at a delta change, if for example, the second sample was hemolyzed, you may actually superiously conclude that, oh, the top T levels actually have dropped or something like that. Uh, while in fact, uh, it's just because the specimen is hemolyzed. Uh, this behaves differently in different platforms. So hemolysis is an important factor uh, that labs should notice and should notify uh, um, you know, physicians about. Uh, the issue of the biotin interference could also be a, a problem uh, for assays that are using biotin. Uh, TROP T uh, su suffers from this uh, problem. But then again, these are patients who are receiving a huge amount of biotin that are totally unphysiological. Uh, so like, in, you know, in cases of multiple sclerosis, for example, uh, these are very, very rare, but we usually have that disclaimer to alert, again, physicians of this potential interference. Thanks. Uh, so just to recap, uh, the lab needs to spin it down, preferably don't, don't underspin, uh, take note of hemolysis. It sometimes gives you a gauge on the values that come back to you. So I want to uh, maybe ask Cynthia then about renal failure patients. Uh, how do you address uh, troponin value in renal failure patients? Uh, then maybe uh, can get uh, Dr. Leila and Prof G to comment again about in renal failure patients, uh, how should we look at it? Cynthia? You're muted, Cynthia, sorry. Uh... Well, what I've been advised from our lab director is that we should use the same delta figures, but keep in mind that they're more prone, obviously, to have chronic elevation. So we may see some big numbers to start. And here is where we really need to do a delta to see if it's changing. And from, I'd be curious to, to hear what Leila has to say about this, but our director has assured us that really you're looking at the same amount of change. And if there is a change, you need to assume that that represents acute injury. So that's how we, um, look at the, the, the levels in, in a chronic patient. So do Leila uh, and Prof G, is there a level in renal failure patients where you say you admit anyway without the delta? 
uh, is there a threshold level, for example, Prop G first before Leila? Yes. So, um, yeah, thank you, Cynthia. Um, first, uh, yeah, of course, the clinical specificity uh, of elevated troponin in uh, renal kidney uh, in uh, kidney failure patients is is very low and uh, can only be improved by delta changes. The problem is that uh, with the fast protocols, with zero and one or zero and two hour protocol, the proportion of patients who are eligible for this protocol drops down to very low amounts. And so it's not so ideal as, uh, uh, let's say, um, a higher cut of uh, uh, decision uh, threshold. For the, uh, the specific question that uh, you asked about uh, a, a higher baseline uh, cutoff in renal uh, failure patients, it's clear that the worse the renal function, the, the higher is the, the chronic elevation level of troponin. But uh, uh, I'm not recommending a specific um, kidney-dependent cutoffs, but rather to, to keep the, the delta change values as they are. Uh, so I think that, is, that keeps uh, things very straightforward and, and convenient for ED people. Leila, you have anything to add to this? Yeah, part? yeah. I, I would I would agree uh, with with uh, Sensia and and uh, with Dr. G as well. It's really you're looking at the delta change. That is the most important thing because uh, patients with uh, s different <laughs> stages of renal failure may have different baseline elevation of the troponin. Uh, so the delta change is, is the most important one. I did come across a co couple of publications advocating actually uh, a higher deltas, uh, higher delta cutoffs, but they are difficult to apply, again, because of the different stages of renal failure that you may, um, you may encounter. So always put the clinical presentation uh, in mind. And, and look at the dynamics, the kinetics uh, of the uh, high sensitivity troponin. Thanks, Leila. I, I'm going to switch tracks a bit and ask uh, Dr. Cesali now. Um, I, I think just one last piece of, on uh, renal failure patients. Is there any value or do you even do creatinine kinase or CKMB in any patients nowadays? Uh, you're muted. Yeah. You're still muted, I think. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, now I can hear you. Okay. So the healthcare structure here in uh, Malaysia, as you know, um, you have your public, you have your private. And in your public hospitals, you have different levels of um, specialization. You have your primary care, your secondary care, and your tertiary and super hospitals. Uh, the secondary hospitals or community hospital or district hospitals um, are usually run by medical officers with specialists visiting them. Now, their catchment areas is usually about 300,000 uh, in population. Um, they would have a high dependency unit plus beds and any uh, very ill patients would be transferred to a tertiary level. Um, in those kind of hospitals, uh, oftentimes they would have access to ECG, CK, CKMB and point of care troponin, not the um, um, SA troponin like Roche or Abbott and so on. So yes, they are still being done. Um, they should not be done. Um, but at the same time, in terms of managing costs, uh, clinical um, acumen plays a huge, huge role. Um, despite normal CK, CKMB and point of care troponin, if they are suspected to have an ongoing acute coin syndrome, they are normally transferred to a tertiary hospital um, or a super hospital like in, uh, the National heart center, for example, for primary or early intervention. Uh, sorry, thanks, Azali. Thanks for that. One uh, useful can you, um, utility. Yeah. Can I just ask you, uh, in Malaysia, are you still practicing a zero three hour algorithm or have you switched to a zero one hour algorithm? Then we'll go back to uh, Cynthia's uh, 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 study. Again, it depends on the landscape. Um, in a very busy emergency departments um, where the facility and the turnaround time is feasible, um, they try, they would go zero three. And most private hospitals um, where the ED load volume is lower, and then a zero one is feasible. 
Um, but oftentimes, in uh, a very busy emergency departments, oftentimes a, a zero three or more often a zero six <laughs> is sometimes supplied. Uh, so it depends on the vigilance of the uh, medical officer and the doctors on the floor, and also the uh, attending nurses to uh, chase the troponin results um, at times. Thanks, uh, Sazali. I, I think I, I think renal failure is always something that we have. Uh, uh, difficult handle on because of the baseline uh, troponin. So I think what I'm hearing is that a trending is more important, the clinical scenario is more important, and the delta is more important. And I think we a lot of centers are moving away all disregarding CK, CKMB in the first place. I think we shouldn't be doing uh, those uh, measurements. Um, I just want to go back now to Cynthia's study proper. So a few observations there. And I'll, I'll, I'll love it if uh, Kenji and uh, Prabhuji, anyone to comment, is that uh, this terminology of ruin, rule out has confused too many people. You know? And uh, I really hate it. But uh, you know, I, I like Derek and uh, Cynthia's study when they look at outcomes. I think you have to prove that whatever algorithm translates to outcome, not time to discharge, how many hours you stay in the ED. Uh, I think it really has to prove that saying that you keep someone in the ruin phase for possible ACS helps improve outcome whether 30 days or one year. I'm not clear that the study shows that the one hour algorithm is superior actually based on the event rate. Um, and uh, I, I wonder whether uh, uh, Kenji or Prof G can comment on Cynthia's study. Um, well, what, what do you guys think? Is 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 the outcome, does it look sensible to you to push it to zero one hours? Is there a big difference? Yes, thank you for your comment and question. And actually, I'm raising my comfort. So still, I know that group does not show any acute myocardial infarction. But uh, around the 400 patients who are stratified in the rural group showed uh, 20, 20 patients who required uh, PCI in 30 days. So that means they are uh, diagnosed as unstable angina. So even if I really agree with uh, uh, Jack's opinion, rule out, terminology of rule out might not be suitable maybe. And still you have to consider uh, the possibility to have a coronary artery disease. So to overcome such a problem, you, know, st you still need a clinical sense using a, like a heart score combination at least in our data, uh, less than four, the heart score are uh, really helpful to make a diagnosis to rule out the even unstable angina. So yeah, I agree. Uh, we have to modify a little bit the terminology. Yeah, Prof G, you want to do a journal critique on a? No, uh, I, first uh, I want to congratulate again. Uh, this uh, study because it, uh, it confers so much evidence based on a randomized trial. So we, we lacked that kind of study. So therefore, I welcome the study very much. A small shortcoming of the study is, uh, of course, that the comparator uh, is not, uh, let's say, the comparator that we would like to see. The comparator was a troponin based uh, on a cutoff of 29 nanogram and not at the 99th percentile, the 14. So, the, uh, but I, I, I am not <coughs> sure that the results of a true comparator study would be worse. I, I think that that uh, that uh, my experience is that the zero and one hour algorithm is at least as effective, if not even uh, safer, and uh, uh, is so much uh, improving. Uh, disposition of patients and uh, handling. And of course, you have to ensure that patients are not discharged uh, after an inappropriate uh, risk uh, uh, estimation. Yeah? And, and the question, do we still need clinical scores if we use very low troponin cutoffs is under debate. Some have questioned the, the need for for risk scoring, but of course you need clinical uh, clinical. Uh, um, judgment. This is very important. It's, you cannot, you cannot switch off your brain uh, using biomarkers. Yeah, but uh, the evidence. I don't know. I'm, I'm a bit mixed about that. The evidence. Uh, maybe Cynthia can comment. The addition of all these hard scores 
adds very little, I must say, to a high sense troponin assay for ROC curves in terms of diagnosis in the studies I've read. So I'm, I, I'm not sure I'm, I'm open to it. I think it helps the junior residents still ask and examine patients. But uh, I'm not too sure about the additive values though. Cynthia, one last comment before I think we need to move on. Oh, you're still muted, Cynthia. Sorry, I think. Sorry. Yes, so I would absolutely agree that if, if we look at a patient falling through, for example, a flow chart, I think that we have to constantly look at the pretest probability of this patient to really have an ACS. Mm -hmm. And I think where the troponin is very valuable is when you're on the fence with a low risk patient. I think where risk scores really come into play is in that gray zone area in the observational group where the troponin is not really helping you. It's, it's just adding a roadblock. And I think there is where I think something like the heart score can really help us to tease out and make sure we don't have bias as to how we assess the risk of this patient. And I think it, at, at every stage of an algorithm, you cannot look at troponin alone. It's just not, not gonna work, you know? So I think we really have to, like uh, Professor G said, we have to use our brains. You can't leave your brain at the door and just look at the biomarker. So um, um, thanks a lot for that. Maybe I can just ask you one question, a quick answer. Between all the scores, which one do you think is preferred? I do like the, the heart score, personally. Um, what we use at our hospital is sort of a modified version of that. Yeah. The only problem with a lot of the scores is there still is those objective features. And what's really, really lovely about troponin is that it's not objective. You know, I mean, it's not subjective. I Pardon me, it's not subjective. So um, it's really nice to have at least one element, you know, like age and troponin, which are really firm markers. And then the subtleties come in with the other aspects of the risk scores. So great comments. Uh, since you're on the line, I'll just have you make one last uh, comment. What is your thoughts on point of care troponin kits in the ED? Yeah, I think... Um, Right now, they're just not sensitive enough, uh, to my understanding. Um, and I think that maybe at some point, I do also think that there's something to be said for staying long enough to be observed for a while for things to change. So you can see the clinical trajectory of the patient. So being able to turn things around very quickly seems very uh, alluring, but I think there is the potential that someone can deteriorate once they're back on the bus outside. So we, we will ask Leila to work harder then for the lab turnaround. So, <laughs> uh, Sazali, um, what are your thoughts on point of care testing? Is it still being done in Malaysia in some centers? Are uh, you still muted, Sazali? Sorry. So thank you, Jack. Uh, yeah, we, we use it quite a bit in fairness. Um, there's a lot of centers who have not migrated yet to um, an analyzer Roche Herbert uh, Troponin assays. Uh, point of care in the ED to me, it's good uh, to rule in. Once it's elevated, just bring them in and work them up, but never to be used as a rule out tool. Uh, you'll just get yourself into so much trouble, I think. So thanks, Azali. So I, I just want to summarize quickly this session before I move and transit. I think all great points. I, I love the two lectures. We didn't have time to flesh out even more. So a few pointers uh, just for the audience is one, uh, Dr. Kenji's point, please this rule in rule out is for disposition, is not to rule out underlying coronary artery disease. So that's something important to note. You don't discharge someone with a tense with a chest pain with a rule out in this algorithm to say he's fine. And I think that's some observation. A lot of people say they're fine, they never show up, but they could have underlying significant CAD, or they could be really in the smaller subset now or unstable angina. The thing about point of care testing, I learned uh, also the observation from Suzali is that, well, if you have a lab-based high sensitive, I see very little point in the point of care in the tertiary setting. But in countries where it's very disparate, I think there's still value as a rule in, but not rule out. So I think those are important points. Uh, with regards to zero one hour algorithm, Prof G point is that it does help. I think the disposition uh, turnover helps hospital workflows. I think a lot of studies have shown that it's pretty decent and probably safe. 
unfortunately, the observation across Asia Pacific is that it's 0, 06, 0, 08 hours. And I, I think we still should try to improve workflow. There are some caveats to high sensitivity troponin T brought up by uh, good points brought up by Dr. Layla. So I think the lab also pitched in by a fast turnover, giving them good specimens or non hemolyzed specimens. Uh, slower spin down time or more complete spin does help. And some of the caveats in renal failure patients uh, and the focus on zero rise. I think uh, zero hour may be still tenuous in some patients. So unless it's truly uh, very, very low. So uh, with that, maybe uh, we'll close the first half of this session and we'll transit to other markers now that may be more exciting for the audience. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about BMP now in diabetes, followed by COVID-19 serology. So I'm going to welcome Dr. Chan Chao to give her lecture live, if she may. Um, as you can see, we are going tight on time. So maybe we can have a 10 minutes uh, from you on her lecture on how to use uh, BMP markers in diabetic patients uh, for risk stratification, uh, observations from the ADOC trial. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chan Chao. Thank you very much for the introduction, um, Lisa. I'll quickly jump into the lecture. Uh, diabetes in and of itself can cause heart failure, and this we've seen across various age groups, irrespective of the age limits. And as you can see, individuals with diabetes are consistently at higher risk of uh, heart failure compared to those without. Even as early as Framingham heart disease, we've noticed this and large scale trials like the IDNT trial in which heart failure was excluded at baseline despite that heart failure hospitalization was the most frequently observed cardiovascular event. And that really what gave us the impetus to look at our uh, the association between diabetes and heart failure in greater detail in our Asian Heart Failure Registry, which is a prospective observational registry, which has uh, nearly 7,000 Asian patients with stage C heart failure with detailed baseline characteristics, echocardiography, and, and independently adjudicated outcomes. This registry runs across uh, 11 Asian regions and 46 sites, as indicated by the stars on this map here. And uh, through machine learning approaches, what we first did was cluster the comorbidities in these heart failure patients. And what we saw was these five naturally forming clusters, namely the elderly AF, the metabolic type, the young subtype, the ischemic subtype. And what was very unique to our Asian region is the final subtype highlighted here in red, the lean diabetic phenotype. This lean diabetic phenotype occurs uh, mostly in patients who are with low BMI. They are not really uh, obese. They are often heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, with concentric hypertrophy. And compared to the other four subtypes, which I uh, described earlier, these patients with lean diabetes have the absolutely worst clinical outcomes and poorest quality of life scores. As you can see here, sadly, Singapore, Malaysia, and Hong Kong top the charts for the lean diabetic phenotypes. So we, we have identified this vulnerable worst outcome group. And this uh, lean diabetic patients have no proven therapy, sadly. So our best, best bet here is to take one step back and look at prevention. However, that in itself is quite challenging because on one hand, we have this increasing prevalence of diabetes, but not all these diabetic patients are at high risk of cardiovascular events. They're quite heterogeneous and only a handful have incident events. So, which is why the previous cardiovascular uh, disease prevention attempts among these uh, diabetic patients have failed because they have uh, blanketly targeted the entire diabetic population with blanket measures of blood glucose, uh, blood uh, pressure, lipids, and so on. Therefore, it's very important to identify, if I may, the purple high-risk individuals out from the green shaded ones for, and prioritize these individuals for uh, high-risk intensified preventive therapy, which uh, on that note, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce or focus on the 2017 ACC AHA focused update where it was uh, emphasized that BNP or anti-pro-BNP screening 
is important as for prevention of uh, individuals for high risk of, for heart failure, specifically for patients at risk at, of developing heart failure, natriuretic biomarker peptide-based screening followed by a team-based care, which included a cardiovascular specialist with uh, uh, GDMT, of course, can be useful to prevent the development of left ventricular dysfunction or new onset of heart failure. This recommendation, as you can see, rests on uh, two important trials, of which I'll be emphasizing a few very quickly in my next few slides. Firstly, the EXAMINE trial, which examined the um, heart failure and mortality outcomes in patients with type 2 diabetes taking allopriptin versus placebo. When they stratified the participants according to quartiles of anti-proBNP, there was a very obvious trend with increasing anti-proBNP quartile, there was increasing proportion of cardiovascular death irrespective of the placebo or the treatment allopriptin arm. Similarly, in Savertimi, when they used a anti-proBNP cutoff of 125 and classified the patients as low or high uh, anti-proBNP, you could see that the risk of heart uh, hospitalization of heart failure was much higher in the high group, again, regardless of the treatment arm. Um, on that note, I would like to introduce the trial Pontiac, which uh, was led by Martin Hulsman, who is also an uh, advisory board member for ADOPT, where Pontiac enrolled um, diabetic patients with no history of cardiac disease, with normal ECG, normal echo, but had an elevated anti-proBNP of more than 125 picogram per mil. Patients were randomized to the standard of care arm or the intensive arm where they were on maximum dosages of RAS inhibitors and beta blockers. When they were followed up for two years, there was a 40% reduction in primary events in the intensive prevention arm compared to the uh, control arm. Now we also have uh, um, evidence, real world evidence from SGLT2 inhibitors, and it's impossible to give a heart failure talk these days without mentioning SGLT2, where in CBD real 2 study, which included Singapore as one of its countries, has shown that uh, um, usage of SGLT2 inhibitors were uh, associated with reduced hospitalization for heart failure, death and hospitalization for heart failure, even if you don't have heart failure at baseline, and more so if you're additionally on RAS inhibitors or beta blockers. And on that note, I would like to introduce to you the Asian Diabetes Outcome Prevention Trial, which is a new trial which uh, is, is starting recruitment uh, in like a few days' times, actually. It's a prospective multinational randomized open-label parallel group active control two-arm long-term morbidity mortality trial. ADOPT is going to be run in six regions, Singapore, Malaysia, China, Taiwan, India, and UAE. In fact, two of our panelists today, Prof. Sazli and Dr. Leila, are key investigators of ADOPT. It's being led by Professor Carolyn Lam from National uh, Heart Center, Singapore. So uh, essentially, similar to Pontiac, we are going to be identifying high-risk diabetic patients with elevated anti-proBNP level with no prior cardiovascular disease. These uh, participants will be again classified to either the control arm who will be on standard of care or the intensive arm where they will be receiving high doses of RAS inhibitors and beta blockers on top of which SGLT2 preferential use is also recommended. These individuals will be followed for two years for events of cardiovascular events. Uh, as I mentioned, we are like days away from starting recruitment, so please stay tuned for results. So to quickly summarize, we have a unique lean diabetic phenotype in heart failure in Asia, and this uh, group of patients have the worst clinical and quality of life outcomes. We have seen success from the usage of biomarker anti proBNP cutoff of more than 125 for uh, effective risk stratification and to identify high-risk individuals with diabetes. And we also have a robust SGLT2 evidence, thus the trial Asian Diabetes Outcome Prevention Trial. Thank you very much. Thanks, Shanchao, for keeping uh, to time. I, I think this is a huge topic by itself. So I, I think I don't want to go into heart failure. <laughs> therapy of course. Will, will not end. 
So I'd like to congratulate Carolyn as well uh, and the team here, Sazali, uh, Layla, for joining the study. It's a huge endeavor. And I will say that, um, wow, Carolyn, as usual, is very smart. I'm sure it's going to be a positive trial. Uh, we know SGLT is doing miracles uh, in heart failure anyway, regardless of if you have diabetes or not. And uh, one thing I picked up from your talk that I liked a lot was that the map of Singapore was three times the size of Malaysia. In the lead <laughs> so, so that was very nice <laughs> for once. Uh, but um, I, I, I think we'll move on to the last talk, then we'll take both questions as a whole, um, because I want to give more time to Professor David Lai to speak to us on uh, COVID-19 PCR and serology to correct some of the uh, cardiologist uh, misconceptions around the topic. So, uh, uh, Professor Lai, please. Thank you, Jack. Uh, and thank you, APSC, for uh, inviting me to share on the, uh, the uh, implications of uh, COVID-19 PCR and serology in clinical practice. So now, you know, whenever people see a virus and, and genomic structure, people glaze over, I'll only make very simple. This is the, the virus that has changed our life. Uh, the spike protein is what is immunogenic. It's also where the receptor binding domain uh, interacts with ACE2 receptor and gets into our cells and cause all the infections. There's this nuclear protein, which is inside the cell and the M protein, the membrane protein and the envelope protein, okay? So just remember, Receptor binding domain is part of the spike protein and this N protein because it's important in terms of PCR and serology. Okay, and this is where they are in the genome. And uh, this is a piece of work published from uh, Singapore early in the epidemic in the pandemic in February. I just want to show people that the virus can be found in the stool on average about fifty percent very uncommonly in the, in the blood, about 10%. So you are doing chronic angiogram, uh, don't worry too much about it, and it's rarely found in the urine, okay? Everyone in this cohort of 18 uh, had the PCR confirmed uh, COVID-19 in the nose swab. And we, we now know, at, at the start of COVID-19, people, people thought it was like SARS. Week one, not much virus, week two, a lot of viruses. But soon, in, in, in the late January and early February, we realized that it's more like influenza. So the viral, the viral load is very high. So this is uh, represented by CD value. The lower CD value, the higher the viral load. And it kind of, you can see kind of declines to a low level. 40 is essentially negative. By about day 14, very important to remember that, day 14. By the end of week two, you may not have detectable virus, but the PCR can still be detectable. Now, in the early part of the pandemic as well, you get a, a, a lot of report of negative PCR in early patients in China. This one shows that in the first test, only 27.5% was positive, and the second test, 12.5%. And this, you may have heard about how in China, they recommended the use of CT scan. Uh, did we see this in Singapore, for example? Not really. So this is data from about, uh, let me see, about close to 200 patients uh, in, 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 in NCID, uh, the first test will pick up about 89% of patients, the second test at another 6%. So the, the, if two tests will pick up about 96%, okay? Of course, you still have a few stragglers up until day 24, but uh, essentially uh, the two swaps uh, will pick up 96%. Uh, so PCR performances have a lot of uh, 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 pros and cons, uh, sampling and, and processing. Uh, but essentially, I think in most uh, countries these days, we accept that the first two swab can rule it out. And, uh, and the patients in our cohort presented roughly around a median of day five, day six. This is another observ observation early in the, in the epidemic. This is a patient from China who was admitted, confirmed PCR positive, and then was monitored. And when two swabs were negative, was discharged from observation. And then during observation in the community isolation, they realized that the swap became positive again. And so you saw, you, you, you see this phenomenon where the viral load declined and then became detectable again for many, many days. Now, is this really a uh, reinfection? Re we now know this is not. What we are detecting is persistent and intermittent shading of viral RNA. So this is a study in China, one of the early study. You can, you can see that the virus can be taken up to day 35. 
there are now uh, reports of uh, persistent positive PCR up until two to three months, but that those are a minority, okay? In this study, uh, the association of prolonged PC, uh, RNA, viral RNA shedding was associated with the male gender. So in COVID-19, being, being male is, is definitely a negative factor. Uh, delayed presentation and also more severe disease requiring intubation. So we repeated, in, in this cohort, there was 130 patients. We repeated this uh, similar uh, analysis uh, in, in, in Singapore, this is an NCID, we had about two, just over 200 patients. We also see that it can be taken up to about day 40. Uh, in univariate uh, analysis, there was association with uh, 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 female gen, uh, with intubation, as well as the treatment of Kalitra. So treating with Kalitra, the HIV drug, actually led to uh, uh, more prolonged shading. However, on multivariate analysis, there was actually no association. So we thought that, uh, you know, what, why the differences between the Chinese study and our study? There was a, fair, a fairly high use of corticosteroid, for example, in the China study, close to 50%, whereas in our cohort, it's only 5%. So we know steroid has been associated with prolonged RNA sh shedding in, in SARS and MERS. So our median duration is similar to the, what, the Chinese study, about 14 days. And intermittent shading, this, was, this wasn't described before, okay? Uh, there was only case reports of intermittent shading, but we detected about four, close to 40% of patients who have intermittent shedding. How do we define this? That means they have PCR positive on the nose, on the nose swab and it became negative. But in, instead of having two negative, they become positive again. So they go positive, negative, positive, negative, and it will drag on. But this period of intermittent shedding on, on average only lasts about three days, okay? And what we show here is that while uh, prolonged shedding was associated with inflammatory cytokines, uh, intermittent shedding wasn't really. So it, it really sh shows it's not associated with, it is, is immunologically uh, much less uh, uh, significant to, to the patient. I will now move on to uh, what does it mean to have prolonged RNA, viral RNA shedding? This is the first report out of uh, Germany. Uh, it shows that viral load was high in the early part of the illness. But I draw your attention to this. This is basically the antibody increasing from about uh, 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 the week, end of week one onwards. And this is positive culture. You do not see any more positive viral culture after day eight, okay? And this is just uh, another way of uh, regression analysis showing the plot. So the probability of having a positive culture uh, uh, declined to zero at about day 10. Okay, so this is the first report, nine patients. Uh, people were intrigued, were uh, hopeful, but many people say too small a study to change practice. And this is another study from Canada. Uh, we show similar things. So culture negative, uh, cycle threshold values are 27, uh, cycle uh, culture positive is about 17, okay? So you can see uh, in the red bar here as well, after probably positive after, there was nothing positive after day eight. Okay, so there's another study from Canada. This is a study from France. Uh, this is Professor Didier Raoult. He was the French professor that started the hydroxychloroquine craze. But nevertheless, he published a, a better study uh, that has uh, 183 samples, of which 129 were positive. So there's a very high rate of positivity because if you look at this Canadian sam uh, study, only 26 out of uh, 90. Uh, and he basically showed that percentage culture positive Applied to nothing after cycle threshold value of 34. Okay, he did not study days of illness, but cycle threshold of 34. This is our Singapore study. We have 14 patients positive out of 73. So our findings of percentage uh, page, uh, samples positive, uh, uh, culture positive with patients who are PCR positive uh, is more in line with the Canadian study. We, we found no positive viral culture after CD value of 30, okay? So essentially what you're seeing now is that yes, there's prolonged RNA shedding, but there's probably no virus that can be detected by culture. That means they don't grow in culture, which also implies they're not infectious, okay? After about, uh, about day 10 to day 14, or cycle threshold value of around 30 to 35. And then we're on the serology, which is what, uh, 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 people are interested in. This is the meta-analysis published in BMJ just a few weeks ago. There are different types of serology. So not all serology is equal, okay? So the lateral four immunoassay is the point of care testing. Sensitivity is pretty low. We don't use it anymore, okay? 
At the early part of the pandemic, many of these lateral flow assays uh, came out of China. We don't use it very much now. The ELISA base is more sensitive, 84%, but the chemiluminescent uh, immunoassay, they are the most sensitive, 98%. If the serology is positive, uh, they are usually specific, but this meta-analysis of, uh, of uh, how many studies is there? Uh, 40 studies uh, shows that in the first week, sensitivity is range from about 10 to 50%. In the third week, that's when you've been pretty confident, okay? And do I have data to show you? I'll show you a few uh, uh, landmark studies, early studies. So this is one of the early studies of more than 200 patients published out of China. They use the ELISA and they, they detect the receptor binding domain. So this is a more specific target and protein is less specific. Okay, I'll show you data about that later as well. So you can see that IgM, IgG starts to appear between around day five, but 90% uh, serology positive is around day 90. Okay, so uh, if you're serology negative, by day 21, you probably have not been exposed to, uh, to COVID-19. Uh, but if you are uh, serology positive, you definitely have been. It also shows that severe disease had a higher IgG. Okay, This is a recurring theme that you will see. This is a second study uh, in Nature Medicine out of uh, China. It uses the more specific chemiluminescent immunoassay, but it detects the N protein. N protein, I told you before, is less uh, 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 specific. I will show you the data to, to, to prove that, but it also has a spike protein, which is important. Okay. And it shows you the same thing 90% uh, positive by day 21, and IgM uh, earlier than IgG. But it also shows that uh, uh, for severe disease, uh, which is the one in red, it is higher uh, between uh, for, uh, for COVID, for severe COVID 19 compared to the milder disease. Okay. So the more severe disease have higher IgG. This is important because it matters when it comes to persistence and waning antibodies. Now, this is very interesting. Uh, from our early samples, we look at ELISA versus the N protein. You can see that, uh, you know, this is the ELISA for uh, SARS-CoV-2. There's a lot of cross-reactivity here. They are positive for both. This is SARS virus, uh, CIRA and it's positive uh, even using the, 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 the uh, SARS-CoV-2, so that's cross neutralization Whereas using a neutralization test, okay, you will find that uh, this is uh, positive for, for SARS and negative for uh, COVID-19. In, in contrast, when you look at the COVID-19 samples, uh, it is uh, negative for, for SARS, but it's positive for COVID-19, okay? Whereas you look at the ELISA with N protein, you'll find a lot of cross reactivity But importantly here, we detected the transgenic antibody towards SAR, collected 17 years later. We recall about 10 patients, uh, SAR survivor, to collect their, their antibody, and we can still find the antibody. So there's hope that in this uh, uh, SARS coronavirus, uh, there is persistence of antibody. Now, in MERS, coronavirus is very different. Very few people develop the transgenic antibody, and they don't persist as, 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 as long, and the titer is also lower. This is another study that we did. Uh, and I'll, I'll take you through it. This is the N protein. So N protein is non-specific. You can see that this is COVID-19. This is SARS, so they cross-reactive. That's number one. But number two here is also very interesting. For the N protein, this is the, uh, this, the, the, the old CIRA collected during in 2003. Uh, they were still, of course, repeated it. It's still detectable there. But the, 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 the recent CIRA, is actually negative, okay? So it tells you that if your antibody is towards the N protein, which is what a lot of ELISA uh, uh, assay uses, uh, that, is, that is more waning over time, okay? This is the fresh specimen collected in 2003. This is the, the new specimen collected in, 201, uh, in 2020, okay? So this is the, that is why the target of the antibody assay is very important. But spike protein, and receptor binding domain, which is a, 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 a portion of the spike protein, you can see that this is COVID-19, this is SARS, not much, not much overlap. This is, uh, this is the test for, for SARS and not much overlap for COVID-19. Uh, same thing for receptor binding domain, okay? So cross-reactivity between N proteins, spike protein or receptor binding domain, RBD, more specific, and antibody waning more for N protein than S1 and receptor binding domain. So we should we need not be too disappointed when we hear about winning antibody. I'll show you why later. Now, one of the problems with their essay is that 
There are different other types. So the, the gold standard is plug reduction drain assay. It takes a few days to do, has been done in PSL3, by microneutralization assay, and there's this marble barrel neutralization assay. This is the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine study published in Lancet uh, two weeks ago. You can see that the titles are all different. Taken at the same time point, uh, they're all different. So it, it points to the fact that neutralization assay has very variable readouts, okay? So what we have done is that uh, Professor Wang Lingfra from Duke and US together with uh, several of us have developed this surrogate VNT. So this is how a vital trend assay uh, works. This is the virus, it binds to the ACE receptor. If you have neutral antibody, it blocks the virus from binding. So you can observe a difference in the, in the, in the, in the wells. However, without the virus, you can do it in BSL2. And so what he does is uh, receptor binding domain is conjugated to this horse reddish protein. And then if it binds to the ACE receptor, that's the signal. But if the neutral antibody uh, and it blocks it from binding, there's no signal. So basically he takes this part, removes the virus and, uh, and it allows the development of a uh, new surrogate neutral test that can be done in an hour in BSL2. Now, this is just published last week in Nature Biotechnology. Uh, a few other groups have now just started to uh, publish similar development. Uh, luckily, we were fast. Now, how good is it compared to the conventional uh, So you can see that the uh, core rate coefficient is 0.86, which is pretty good. And it's also confirmed in terms of sensitive specificity, more than 98% in Singapore as well as in China. So a few hundred patients in, in both cohorts. So this is quite reliable. It's now being validated in different parts of the world, New Zealand, Australia, Mayo Clinic in the US and so on. Now, now I'll touch lastly on this topic that worries people. This is a study that came out of China a, a few weeks ago. They used the, uh, the chemiluminous assay and they show several things. If an asymptomatic patient in blue, the IgG is lower. That's number one, okay? Not so much for the IgM. And this is the, this is the IgG. And this is a convalescent sample. So this is acute around uh, three to four weeks of exposure. And this is eight weeks after hospital discharge. So it's kind of like between two to three months, okay? This is the, the next slide is the one that worries people. So it shows a decline from acute to convalescent samples, asymptomatic as well as symptomatic, okay? This is using IgG. For neutralization, there's also a decline, okay? So, but importantly here is that using the IgG, uh, a lot more than 90% of decline, and the median decline is quite high, 70%, okay? And in fact, 40% uh, of the asymptomatic became seronegative by IgG, and 12% became seronegative, okay? But using pseudovirus, they didn't use uh, the, 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 the true, let's say, um, they, they found a lot fewer of the symptomatic, uh, uh, so it's generally less decline, and also the median increase is less, okay? Only around 10% decline in asymptomatic or symptomatic, okay? So when we talk about antibody waning with no matter long-term immunity, uh, don't worry. It's, it's really more about the assay. Neutralizing antibody is what protects us, okay? And, but about 40% of asymptomatic and about 10% of symptomatic will become seronegative, okay? Uh, and uh, from our data in, in Singapore is about, uh, uh, about 20%, okay? About 20%, so very similar range. But do we have to worry too much about the uh, winning antibody, okay? So this is uh, just published out of the, our own, our cohort as well, uh, NU, uh, in the NUH, uh, uh, SGH, as well as NCID with Professor Antonio Bertolatti from the NUS. What it shows is that, that there, are, there are T cells recognizing the different T cell epitopes in the, in the N protein, as well as the non-structural protein 7 and 13. Okay, so these are memory T cells. Okay, so remember that we have to be vaccinated. Even if the title falls below 10, you don't have to worry because the, the memory T cells will activate the, B, the plasma cells and then there will be antibody. And more importantly here is that in the SARS patient have something similar and the, 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 the non-exposed the non -exposed patient. So this, this points towards perhaps uh, seasonal coronavirus, okay? So this is the first average of memory T cells and we are now continuing to follow our patients uh, long-term after two years to study this. That's all I have. Thank you for your attention. Happy to take any questions. Thanks, uh, uh, Prof. Lai, that was amazing. I, I really enjoyed it. There's so much information there. So many questions from me, but I'm going to defer to the question from the audience first. 
So a clinical question uh, from one of the audience, uh, Antoro, uh, is, uh, David, can we use actually CT on the chest CT uh, value of less than 30 to look at the infectious state of uh, asymptomatic patients? It, how, how is CT used? Or yeah. is a clinical question? I think uh, WHO has now changed recommendation that you can possibly be de-isolated after about day 10 or day 14. Now, CT value is not used very much because a lot of labs uh, don't report it, okay? And uh, depending on what machine you use, you may or may not be able to get that, that information readily, okay? Now, in Singapore, we have now report CT value for every single sample. And if you have that, it's more specific. Because if you tell me, are you, can, can I be sure that truly there'll be no positive viral culture after day 10, day 14? Actually, there are case reports. There was a case report from Taiwan, positive at day 18. Okay, but CT value will represent to you the amount of virus detectable. So I think CT value is available is better, but when it's not available, day 14 is quite okay. And in Singapore, we are more worried, I want to be more cautious, we use day 21. So, so that is, you know, we give that margin of error over. Thank you. Uh, Leila, do you have any concerns from the PATH lab about the lectures uh, that uh, David presented? Yeah, well, Jack, that was an excellent uh, presentation, really. I uh, thoroughly enjoyed it, and uh, I think it, uh, it shed a light on several aspects. Uh, and I just want to uh, highlight a few things. Uh, first of all, the late amplifiers uh, that uh, Prof. Uh, Lai indicated. So these who continue to shed the virus, uh, and, uh, you know, and we pick them up, but they have late amplifications and the fact that they are really not infectious and the fact that they also may fluctuate. And I used to get lots of phone calls, oh, this is a false positive, a false negative, and all this dilemma um, in the clinicians really not understanding why the patient was negative by RT-PCR and now you're, you're saying he's positive again after five days of, of being negative. Uh, so this is a very important point. The serology aspect was uh, very, very important as well. Now, most of the commercial assays that are available now in the, in the labs uh, that, you know, in, in common hospitals and so on, are the chemiluminescence immunoassays or the ELISAs. And one have to ask the question whether these uh, antibodies are direct towards the spike proteins or the N or the nucleocapsid, so as uh, Prof. Lai indicated. But also the importance of the neutralization assays and also the role of the T helper cells. Uh, these are very, very important uh, points that he highlighted, which will also shed a light uh, later on for the vaccine and you know how uh, frequent should we be receiving this vaccine? How long would it last? Will the T memory cell help then mount the immune response and, and so on? So these are very, very important uh, uh, elements that he highlighted, which will help us later on understand how to best apply the vaccine. Thanks, Leila. Again, great points. Uh, I, in the interest of time, I'm just going to ask David one last question before moving to close. Uh, David, I, I don't want to put you on the spot. There's 141 vaccines in development, about 20-something in trials. If it does come and it comes to Singapore, for example, uh, how do you implement a vaccine program? Who gets it first? Who gets it last? Or should we, should we be all equal? Okay. So um, I think that, I mean, this is an amazing pandemic, isn't it? I mean, I mean, we know so much about treatment, rapid diagnostic development, and now we've got vaccines. It's, it's amazing. Uh, not most of this will fail. Uh, so far, all the candidates have able to produce neutral antibody, but there's a difference. Some of them have very low level for 816. And now you can see from the natural history of the patients, you've got low level neutral antibody, it will, it, will, it, will, it will win. And these are not natural infections. We are not sure about memory T cells there. Uh, <coughs> and uh, so I will pick a vaccine that produces high trunk titer at, uh, at the early time point and follow them very carefully. That's number one. Number two is who do we protect? I think you have to protect the healthcare workers because without healthcare workers, uh, uh, you know, in ED, in intensive care, on the floor, uh, sick patients uh, will, will have, you know, will, will, will suffer. You see this at the epicenter of every uh, uh, outbreak in Wuhan, in Lombardy, uh, in New York, whereas the rest of the country have much lower uh, uh, case fatality. Uh, on top of that, it will be the old, because it's very clear that if you are 30 years old, you'll be fine most of the time. Yes, there's a few young people who, who will die, but most of the time, death occurs in very old people with comorbidities. So the old people uh, should be vaccinated first. Of course, 
old people, will they have less strength in the body? The answer so far from a few uh, uh, trials we have tested patients over 70 is that, yes, they are slightly lower, but still fairly high. Uh, so uh, I think there's hope, but the, the phase three trial is a key. Yeah, thank you. So I, I hear some caution there, and uh, I would say maybe I generalize a little bit to say frontline workers, maybe the policemen and oh yes, yes and, true, and, and not just healthcare workers. So I, I think workers. also our teachers and, and everyone else who's on the front line. So um, but again, uh, sorry to put you on the spot there, David, but good points. Um, now I I think in the interest of time, I would like to just quickly uh close out the session. I, I think I had great fun, and I would like before closing out to invite every of my panelists as well as speaker to raise one teaching point for the participants to take back from this session. Just one point from each uh, uh, panelist. So I'll start with Prof G first. If you want the attendees to bring back one learning point from this session, what would that be? I would uh, like to make people be uh, assured of, um, of the use, safe use of high sensitive troponin and Clement the FAST protocols and don't be afraid of legal issues or of missed MIs because in the era of high sensitivity, that problem has declined a lot. So, okay, word of reassurance. Dr. Leila, your one learning point uh, for the attendees. Just the role of the neutralizing antibodies and the T uh, memory cells. Okay. Dr. You. Cynthia? Uh, I would say the, the concept of making sure that although high sensitivity troponin is terrific, that we still need to think and look at the patient and that we are ruling out a non-STEMI and not, you know, coronary artery disease. So good point. Look at the patient. Don't look at the numbers. Uh, Dr. Chan Chao? I would say that um, Asia has a very unique lean diabetic phenotype and uh, only best bet here is to look at prevention using biomarkers. So we need to restratify our at-risk group, predominantly yes. diabetes upset. Uh, Professor Kenji? Uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, pretty similar with a sincere opinion. Uh, use your brain, use your brain. <laughs> Not only the troponin, because you are a doctor. Yes. <laughs> Professor Sazali? Uh, you're muted, uh, Sazali. Well, actually, I echo Chen Shao. Um, diabetic cardiomyopathy is underrated, but it is um, lurking, and we should be more aware of it. And appropriate use of biomarkers should really be um, utilized here. Um, Professor David Lai? One point. Okay. There's no true infection, it's due to persistent viral RNA shedding, and that uh, uh, there is persistent sort of antibody, and we can be hopeful. Thank you. So uh, maybe one last point for me. I, I think I'd like to bring a positive close to this uh, session. I think we talk about COVID-19 all day long, but I, I will say COVID-19 is not the be all and end all. It will pass. I'm hopeful of that. But I can assure you diabetes, cardiovascular disease will forever <laughs> be there. So I think we need to invest more of our energy and resources and uh, research into cardiovascular disease, whether in a doc trial, whether is uh, uh, Cynthia and uh, Professor Kenji and G's uh, research in addressing cardiovascular care. That's my pitch. Not cancer care, cardiovascular care <laughs> as well. <laughs> so uh, with that, um, I really uh, enjoyed today's session. I want to thank the questions from the participants. I'd like to thank uh, all my faculty and speakers who spent either a public holiday or really your, 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 your Hari Raya day with us. Uh, so I want to wish everyone a blessed Hari Raya Haji and I have a best weekend uh, uh, ahead. Thank you very much and keep safe. Thank you, bye-bye. <coughs>